Chapter 17 The Blue Grotto Chris awoke up late the next morning, and when she saw Zack, he was sitting at the round table in their eating hollow, surrounded by her family. Her sister seemed very interested in him. You didn't tell me you had two such stunning sisters, he said, making way for her at the table and offering her a bowl of berry soak and melted honeydew. I'm glad they like you so much. I only wish Pips and Batty felt the same way. Krista, Zach's been telling us about a place called School, said Fern. It sounds so funny. Sounds like a good idea to me, replied Grandfather Ash, gulping down a stem full of fruit nectar. Especially the bit about learning. I wish there was more learning and less skylarking around this forest. Krista, there's been trouble in the forest overnight, said her mother, not wishing to rake over old arguments. I'm going out to Possum Wood. There's something out there making the baby sick. We'll meet you out there after dance class, said Fern, leaping up from the table. Come on, Lily, or we'll be late again and Myrtle the turtle will be furious. I'm going to help with repairs to the canopy, said Ash, getting up from the table and pulling on his waistcoat. Whole sections of the forest are reporting damage of some sort, and there wasn't a storm last night. It's very strange. Krista told them she was taking Zack to the Blue Grotto to collect some crystals and herbs that might help the animals. She hurried Zack outside and showed him an easy way to climb down Old High Rise. While he was slowly and carefully climbing down, she told him about her friend, the Strangler Fig. Did you know that this tree grows down instead of up? That makes it pretty special, doesn't it? First of all, a seed is dropped in a fork or a branch of a tree, and this seed then has to send out a long, thin runner to the ground. When it hits the ground, it branches out and forms a hollow trunk of roots around the tree. It's great to live in because the trunk is so thick, and yet there's a hollow up the center, so it's always cool and airy. And... She grinned at Zack. There's fruit on this tree most of the year. That's why so many birds live in it. Once on solid ground again, Zack looked up and admired the towering tree. He saw that it was decorated with hundreds of staghorn ferns and climbing orchids. Okay, you've convinced me it's special, he said. So, what's next? Krista told him they were going to the Blue Grotto but, to her surprise, he wasn't at all pleased. But I thought we were going to find this magic character. Remember your promise to unshrink me? Oh, Zack, aren't you having a good time? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong is I'm suddenly knee-high to a grasshopper, which may seem fine to you, but believe me, it's very weird. Krista tried to hide her disappointment. It's just that I thought you might want to stay here for a while. Blackbeak flew down to join them, and Krista asked him if he'd give them a lift to the Blue Grotto, then fly them to Magiloons. Blackbeak was only too happy to oblige, and soon they were being ferried through the trees on his back. Like Zack, Blackbeak was an outsider. Long ago, he had arrived in Fern Gully from another rainforest and stayed. He was blind in one eye and had a stump of a leg, but he would never talk about where he'd come from or how he'd received his battle scars. As they flew towards the Blue Grotto, the trees grew closer together, and soon they were flying through leafy archways of interlocking palms and tree ferns. When they reached the Blue Grotto, Blackbeak said he'd be back to collect them after he'd visited some cockatoo friends nearby. It was a hot, steamy morning, and Zack was happy to see they'd stop at a perfect place to swim. 
Above the entrance to the Blue Grotto was a series of crystal clear pools. He pulled off his sneakers and t-shirt and dived into the clear sparkling water. Krista dived gracefully after him. <laughs> then surfaced next to him, riding the tail of a young platypus. She laughed at his surprise and beckoned him to follow her towards an underwater cave. Inside the cave, it was very quiet. The walls glowed with a soft blue light. Krista filled her pouch with tiny crystals she chipped from the rocks. When her pouch was full, she led Zack around the slippery rocks to a deep chasm which separated them from more underwater caves. We have to cross this to get into the Blue Grotto, she said, trying not to smile. Zack said there was no way he was going to risk his life by plunging into it, but Krista laughed. It's an illusion, silly. It only looks deep because of the reflection of the blue rocks above it. But it's really shallow. She waded through it to show him where another series of pools glistened in the eerie blue light. Bending over one of them, Krista stirred the water and created a spinning top with it. She whisked it out of the water and threw it to Zack. But when he caught it, the bubble burst and he was drenched. You'll keep, he shouted, watching her dance away from him across the top of the shallow underground pools. But he found there was no way he could walk on top of the water. Krista copied his clumsy attempts and they laughed and splashed around from one pool to the next. Then she led him to the one pool she knew was really deep. Tiptoeing across the top of it, she beckoned him to follow. He stepped into it and disappeared. She dived in to rescue him, but now it was her turn to be surprised. Zack grabbed her around the waist and surfaced, holding her high above his head. Gotcha now, he cried. But to his amazement, she disappeared in a burst of shimmering light. All that was left was the glowing outline of her body hanging in the air above his head. She tricked him again. He turned and saw her disappear into a cave and he followed her. The cave was lit by millions of glowworms. Krista smiled when she heard Zack catch his breath at the sight of them, for it was exactly the reaction she'd hoped for. The Blue Grotto was a very special place. She looked at Zack in the twinkling light and was glad she'd brought him here. They left a sparkling phosphorescent trail behind them as they swam slowly into the center of the cave. Zack floated on his back, looking up at the glowworm ceiling. He felt as though he was in heaven, with a million stars shining down on him. Krista floated in the air above him, glowing with her own dazzling beauty among the twinkling lights. As he watched her, he knew that she touched his heart forever. He knew he would never forget this moment. As if sensing this, Krista dived into the water and surfaced to face him. She held out her hands towards him, and when he touched them, she locked their fingers together. Zack felt lighter than air. Without thinking, he leaned forward and kissed her. Krista looked stunned when they parted. But Zack was even more stunned when he discovered they were no longer in the water, but hanging motionless in the air, suspended under the twinkling lights of the glowworm cavern. What's happening? He whispered. What do you mean? She asked, looking at him tenderly. He nodded towards the water below. We're hanging in space, in case you haven't noticed. Krista smiled, then loosened her hands. They floated slowly back into the water. 
My body feels so light, he said. That's because it is. That's the magic of fairy love. We share the same feelings now. She swam back towards the narrow opening to the cave. She told them they shouldn't stay for too long because the magic in the blue grotto was so strong it could entice them to stay forever. Zack said he wouldn't mind, but Krista insisted that they leave. I thought you wanted to see Magi Loon and get on shrunk, she said when they finally clambered onto the rocks below Crystal Falls. Later, you were right. I do like it here. No, I promised. I cast a spell and shrank you by mistake. Such a spell must be reversed. She sat beside him on the rocks, drying her wings. They were both so happy that they didn't see the telltale signs of Hexus all around them. They didn't know Hexus had followed them to Crystal Falls, poisoning everything in his path.